actually had prepared a message throughout the week that I had planned on use this, using this morning. Went over it Friday morning like I often do. Went on my prayer walks and talked to the Lord about it. Had seven different pages to put up on the wall. Talking some about end times. I'm going to speak from Matthew 24 was my plan in Revelation 3. About the Laodicean church. We'll probably will use that next week. But last evening I told Pam, I said, you need to pray for me overnight. I feel like God's stirring me and changed the message. That doesn't happen to me real often. And the uh, Lord always knows who's going to be here. He waits and watches and sees. I don't know all those reasons and don't, don't try to figure it out. But I felt this morning as we both agreed in prayer that I would make the right decision as I began to write the notes that God changed what I was to talk about this morning. So I feel this has specific purpose. I believe the other message did too, and I believe it needs to be used another time. But God knows the mix of people. Never will we meet just like we are this morning. Never again will we live September 14th, 2014. Never will we, we be assembled just like this. This is a unique day. It's very important to realize that. We can get into the whole hum of life. And, you know, it's just another day. Same old stuff, you know. I'll say it like a lot of people say it. Same old stuff. That's not true. I saw a sign, see if I can remember how it says it. Lost forever. 24 golden hours containing 60 diamond minutes. I forget. It broke it all down into seconds. And, but it made you realize that time was precious. A little short poem it was, but it made you realize that time is precious and valuable. And the Bible says as Christians, our times are in His hands. Don't get lost in the world's thinking. The world lives by luck and chance. I hope my ship comes in. I hope uh, something will work out. I hope that something, uh, sometime I'll get my lucky break. We don't live that way. When we come under the umbrella of God's grace and love and we experience forgiveness and we accept Jesus Christ into our heart, we enter into a new realm. The Bible says a righteous man's steps are order to the Lord. And he knows your every step. And he is conscious, conscious constantly of what you're doing. That doesn't mean you're necessarily tuned into it. And we want to all do better at that as we grow. But I feel today for some reason, and I'm going to trust it, that I am to share a few thoughts. And with the time, I think it will work out too because I don't anticipate talking real long today. My brother-in-law said a statement to me when he and I were talking a few weeks ago that just really hit me. And I have it here on the wall. He said, I don't want to make any decisions that will hinder the will of God for my life. I want you to be extremely attentive this morning because I believe with all of my heart that this has significance today for this group. I don't want to make any decisions that will hinder the will of God for my life. American Christians, you that attend CMO, we're growing to love you so much, some new to the group, others we have such roots with, this is a huge issue because I think the enemy derails us so many times through our decisions. You follow me? Our decisions. I often say to our church board, men, I know it's evening, I know we're tired, but, the dis but what we're living out right now, we decided a year ago. We're living out what we decided a year ago. I like the saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. A lot of people in my life isn't changing. Well, if you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always got. Don't do the same old thing and expect a different result. The Bible says, we're going to do a new thing. God wants to birth something in our lives. He wants to do something in our lives. I don't want to make any decisions 
that will hinder the will of God in my life. That's a huge issue. Don't tune me out and say, I already know that. Stay with me. The schemer, Ephesians 6, says that the schemes of the enemy will not turn to us. It's a passage we refer to often in this ministry. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And it talks there about the schemes of the enemy. I don't think we realize how subtle and crafty he is and how easily we fall into this thing. I don't want to make decisions that hinder the will of God in my life. Oh, there's temptation out there. And, and obviously we want to resist that. And, but I think there's many of us that have made some headway in that area. I think there's many of us that our walk of the Lord is strong enough that uh, you're a Christian man here and, 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 you know, maybe you've walked with the Lord long enough that, you know, the devil isn't tempting you to, to steal or to, to uh, view raw pornography or, or to cheat on your wife or, or uh, on and on we could go. But the enemy, the schemer, studies you and I. And wants to cause us to make decisions that will veer us away from the will of God for our lives. When you're at a new level, and I think many of you are stepping up. When you're at a new level, there's a new devil. New level, new devil. I believe that. I've seen it in my own life. I have had times when I was caught off guard only to realize that the enemy was working on me in a way that was a little different than I was accustomed to. I want to say that again. There was times as I've gone to a new level in, in walk with the Lord that I would be blindsided by not realizing that the devil worked in a, in, in a new area. Uh, he wasn't going to try this stuff over here too much. Didn't have any drawing when I drove by a bar. None, none at all. None at all. And maybe that's an issue for you. We're all at different stages. I understand that. I don't mean to be insensitive. But as you grow in the Lord, there'll be some of those things that will fade away. But the enemy watches you, and he's had 6,000 years experience working with every personality. And he wants to make, cause you to make decisions that will hinder you from doing the will of God in your life. For it's in God's will and the center of God's will that we have peace and joy and empowerment and anointing and protection and fulfillment. It's in the center of God's will. I was in a prayer room one time. Kathy Reese was in there with us. We were having a prayer time. I heard her say something. Stay with me. She said, Lord, we don't want to be a click off. We don't want to be a click off. Because Lord, if I, as we talked about that statement afterwards, if you get a click off, it's just a click to start with. But as you move along, you're farther and farther. And there's things that the enemy isn't going to waste his time with you. As he sees you're committed. He sees you in a worship service listening to Brian's song and the, the, the beautiful songs that were sung this morning and, and, and he sees the look on your face and he knows, you, he knows you're committed. He knows you're serious about serving God. But he'll try to affect your decisions so that a year from now, stay with me, I'm going somewhere with this, so that a year from now you're over here. I've seen this happen in my own life. I've had times that I had a sense I'd gotten off track, but I didn't know where it happened. And I would say, Lord, to avoid this, illuminate me. Show me where I got off. And he would say, it was this decision, or it was that decision. And they can be good things. I want you to be attentive to this. They can be good things. You might look at me this morning and say, Pastor, no stronger points than you're making so far. You seem pretty intense. 
That's because I don't think we see this quite. You get the spirit revealing. Keep going here. I don't want to make any decisions that hinder the will of God and what He wants to do. I had someone recently that I went to, and I said, there's nothing wrong with this thing you want to do. And it wasn't easy for me to say, there's nothing wrong with this. And it, and it even can be a good and notable thing. But my perception is, and I need to tell you this as your pastor, that my perception is that this decision is going to cause you then to make this decision. And then because of that, then you'll have to go ahead and make that decision. And the devil has a scheme here to get you off track. New level. New devil. God's perfect will is where the peace is, the joy is, the empowerment, the anointing, the protection, fulfillment. I've been pleading with God in my prayer walk and saying, Lord, in my final season of life, which I'm entering, I'll be 60 in March. In my final season of life, I want to be more effective than I've ever been before. I want my single lines to be more anointed than ever before. I want to be dead center in your will. But I believe he'd like me to make decisions right now. That could veer me away from that. And they can be good things. What is. For just a second. Let's exit over here. Stay with me. What is God's will for our life? Well don't get hung up on that. First of all. Due to time I want to quote some things. That other times I would turn to. What is God's will for our life? So we're just, we're just moving over here onto the exit ramp for a second to the rest part. What is God's will for our life? If, if, if he tries to make decisions to affect his will, what, if the devil influences his indecisions and wants to, what, what is God's will for our life? Well, first of all, John 17 makes it clear that it's God's will that we know him. John 17, it says, this is life eternal that you may know him. The Father in Jesus Christ whom He has sent. So, a lot of people get all hung up with, well, what am I supposed to do? What's God's will for my life? I told the mentoring group this week, hey guys, 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 come back to, come back to the middle here. God's main will for you is that you know Him. It's more important what you are than what you do. He wants you to know Him. So, if He can get you to make decisions way back here and influence you to make decisions that will veer you away from really knowing Him, he will do that if possible. Also, His will is His path for you. And that's what we tend to think of. But really, the first one's the most important. That we would know Him. But His will is His path for you. The course He would have you to take. Romans 12 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So we can spend a lot of time stewing about what's God's will for me. John 17 says, this is eternal life, that, that we would know Him. That's, that's His will for you. He wants you to have life and have it more abundantly. He wants you to know Him. He, wants to, and he walked with Adam in the cool of the day and was sad and sorrowful when he cried, Adam, where art thou? I've often said the saddest words in the Bible are, Adam, where art thou? <laughs> because he had strayed from that personal relationship. So God's will for us is to know Him. And then He has a course and path for our life. Let's go into a little bit Jesse's statement. I don't want to make any decisions that will hinder the will of God in my life. And I had this with such intensity this morning. I almost wondered if there are those here that are teetering in the balance on a decision. And maybe God is using this this morning to... To influence that, I don't know. Jesse said to me, Tom, two years ago, he kind of smiled. He said, I wanted to buy a new motorcycle so bad. Nothing wrong with Jesse buying a new motorcycle. Jesse was a faithful man, tithed his income, gave offering, been sacrificial. He said, and we were talking about this whole issue. He said, two years ago, I went to buy a new motorcycle. And we had talked about maybe doing a little traveling together as we get older and things. And he said, Tom, I had an unrest in my heart about doing that. 
I could afford it. I could afford the payment. He likes gold waves. So he had looked at a, somebody called him, heard he wanted one. Of course, Jess is an influential guy and had a lot of friends. And so people heard that he's kind of looking for a motorcycle. And he, someone called and told him, you know, it's thousands of dollars, obviously. It would be a pretty good sized payment, but he was uh, blessed in some ways financially and able to do that. He said, Tom, I had an unrest about that. And he said, finally, I just decided I'm going to keep the 87, 1987 bike that I have. And then he smiled and he said, I wouldn't have been able to go to Haiti with you these last four times had I bought that motorcycle. Now, anything wrong with buying a new motorcycle? No. Don't let the enemy he said, I don't want to make any decisions that hinder the will of God for my life. You with me? The enemy studies us. That's why he's called a schemer. You're here and he's studying you. And he's watching you. He's watching me. He's had 6,000 years experience dealing with mankind. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our likes and dislikes. He knows our passions. And I think American Christians get sucked into this huge... He wants us to make decisions that will ultimately get us off track. Jesse has felt very strongly that he was to get involved in the faith missions. That was a huge help to me. Shouldering quite a bit of responsibility, a big answer to prayer for me. I knew that we were to be involved and take this under our umbrella. And I knew that that God had spoken to me, but I also had a strong sense and received the counsel of others as well that you can't do everything, even though there's need out there. And so, Lord, I wrestled some this year with the decision. Of, Lord, I felt that you did this. I don't think it was just emotion or attachment to my father. Or, I felt we were supposed to do this, but you, you've got to work it out. I can't do this. The enemy is a schemer. If I can trip up Jess... I can hinder him from doing my will. We had a couple a number of years ago coming to the church doing so good spiritually. Just doing so good. Every time the lights were on, they were here excited about the church. It's actually... It's all the kingdom of God. I get mixed up which building it was. I think it was in Zion Chapel. I was there 13 years. Doing, they were just doing well and growing. Lord, get their family. They had lots of problems and the family's back intact. And, and, and they were, you know, coming to Bible studies we were having at the time and growing in the Lord. And one of the things I heard him vocalize was that we want to do more as a family. We haven't been the Christian family we should and that's a good thing. And and one day they came in and they told us that they had picked up camping and that they bought a new camper. I don't know why, but inside my heart just sank. It did. Not my business. People buy. It's not my business. But I got to be honest, in my spirit, I just had a sadness. They were excited. This would give them more time with family. When we got home that day at dinner, I told Pam, I said, this is a scheme of the enemy because it's going to take them out every Sunday. It's going to take them out of church every Sunday. Sure enough, that happened. It wasn't long until camping was the greatest thing. Uh, nothing wrong with camping. We enjoy camping. It's a healthy thing. I'm telling you, the enemy works in subtle ways. Don't, don't take that wrong. But I think as American Christians, we need to be wise to that. Brian just so appropriately sang, if it, means more to me, if it becomes more important to me than God, then it's an idol. <laughs> it's an idol. And the scripture calls us to cast down our idols. And I remember I had a sadness, and I didn't even know why for sure, but I just had a sadness about it. And that afternoon, I felt the Spirit reveal to me why I felt that way. I said, you watch what's going to happen. They're going to begin missing every Sunday. And before long, this is going to become so important to them. And that's exactly what happened. I don't want to make any decisions 
that hinder the will of God in my life. You know, maybe you're supposed to start a camping ministry, and you're not even supposed to be here. And you're supposed to minister at campground. So God can work in all kinds of ways. So I don't want that. You could go out. You can misunderstand this message. And that's why it's a little tedious. I don't want to make any decisions that hinder what God wants to do in my life. I see Americans do that constantly. I think financially that's a big deal. We need a new carpet. We need to do this. And the devil's constantly dangling something in front of us. And we get ourselves in a financial position where we are in dire straits. And we can't be. Has anybody relate to that? And we can't be what God wants us to be. We can't do. And we have to work so much to pay for it all. And the enemy sits back and laughs because he had that plan two years ago. There's a whole lot of wisdom in recognizing, will this decision hinder the will of God in my life? I'll tell you, it works. It works. I begin praying that way more and more. Lord, this looks good to me. It looks kind of appealing and I'm excited about it. Is there anything about this decision that will veer me away from what I need to be? Lots of innocent things that the enemy can use. Ooh, I have written here, be careful. I have written to be careful on this one. Will you receive this? I think even children and family and grandchildren. The enemy can use things that appear very, very healthy. Will you receive that from me? Please. And it can veer you away from things that God would have you do and be. You'll know in your heart of hearts as you spend time with God. You'll know in your heart of hearts what you should be involved in. And just to give you a practical example of that, I want to say something about Steve and I. Steve and I are grandparents to two of the same kids. I think that God uses Steve in a way that I can't do because of my schedule, and I think it's supposed to be that way. There's things that Steve's able to do with the two oldest grandchildren, or the oldest grandchild, Braxton, and our only daughter, our granddaughter, Addison, that I'm not able to do. With my schedule and the way my weekends are. And so, we want to be in tune with what we're supposed to be. But I don't want to make any decisions that will hinder what God wants to do in my life. The scripture says that we need to be at a level of commitment where we, Christ is absolutely first. That's where I want to be. Decisions. In every decision as a follower of Christ, first we need to ask ourselves, is there any way this could hinder God's will in my life? The devil watches you. <clears throat> he knows that your quiet time for your makeup and your schedule and the type of person that you are emotionally, he knows that your quiet time in the morning is essential. You're not one that can pray and spend time with God in the evening. You're like me. You're overwhelmed in the evenings and you're not able to do that. And you need your mornings. He studies you. He sees that. Along comes the need for some extra income and you even ask friends to pray, I'd like to find a job, and a job seems to open up that uh, you're able to work at the donut shop from 5 a.m. I'm not aware of anybody doing that, by the way. You're able to work at the donut shop from 5 a.m. till 9, and you're jumping up and down with joy because you're happy because you're going to be off at 9 and have the rest of your day, and you've got four hours out of the way, and you can make some extra money when the enemy himself knows that your quiet time in the morning is your best time and essential time. I don't want to make any decision that will hinder God's will in my life. So when we make a decision, four simple things. Is there any way this could hinder God's will in my life? Number two, when I'm all alone with God, 
do I feel uneasy in any way about this decision? The Holy Spirit will give you a restlessness. Jesse told me when he was looking at motorcycles, he said, Tom, every time I go look at one, he laughed about it. He said, every time I go look at one, he said, you know how we like motorcycles. He said, every time I go look at one, I would just have an uneasiness and I'd tell Mary, and I'd say, oh, I just don't have peace with God about this. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a man who's been faithful and helped and given and sacrificed and given time all his life like Jesse. Nothing wrong with only giving motorcycles. Nothing wrong with that. Don't believe it. James it says, God gives all things rich to enjoy. But I think that this is a pitfall, especially for American Christians, because I think he studies us and he dangles in front of us these opportunities, these things, and wrong priorities to get us to make decisions because he knows it will ultimately veer us away from what God would have us do and be. And Jess said to me, Tom, I'd have never gone to Haiti with you and taken this new position in the mission had I done, gone the route I was going to go. Beware of the enemy's schemes. When I'm alone with God, do I feel an uneasiness in any way about this decision? Don't override that. Daddy used to call it spiritual sense of smell. You discern something just doesn't feel right. Something doesn't sense right to you. And I want to tell you that that ability, and, and people are gifted in different ways in the body of Christ. Now, I'll go in, into that in just a second. But I believe that every Christian, there's a difference between being given the gift of discernment. Sometimes a person is especially gifted. Maybe someone's especially gifted prophetically or, or in a variety of ways. But there's, there's a difference between being definitely gifted in discernment. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit if they seek Him. And the Holy Spirit will guide us and guard us. John 14, 15, 16, and 17, where Jesus was leaving and described the Holy Spirit, He was very clear that the Spirit would lead us into truth. And the Spirit will give you an uneasiness. Don't override that. Every time I have overrode a prompting from the Holy Spirit, I've lived to regret it. Every time. I've had times when I had an uneasiness with a person. Pam can tell you this. I've had times when I would meet somebody and everybody, man, did they, they have bells and whistles. And everybody just thought they was the greatest person in the world. And I'd tell her, I'd say, there's something wrong. <laughs> there is something wrong. When I shake hands with that person, when I look them in the eye, I feel something in my heart. Something isn't right. Every time I've overrode that, I've lived to regret it. I had a man a number of years ago. Man, oh man. He just seemed like the greatest thing in the world. And I just had an uneasiness with around this guy. Finally, due to all he was doing in the church, and I thought, man, I must be nuts because a lot of people thought, man, is the greatest guy in the world. So I got this guy involved only to greatly regret it. And then I felt like the Lord said, I tried to tell you that, and you weren't listening. To that uneasiness that the Spirit gives us, that guiding light of the Holy Spirit, hear me here, that comes in your quiet time. Now, some people are just gifted more in discerning. I understand that, and I'll get to that in a minute. But don't cop out on that. Because the Holy Spirit will guide you in decisions. What happens is, is the schemer does everything he can to keep us from having our quiet time because it's in our quiet time that this ability is developed. <coughs> It's in our time with God, alone with God, that He teaches us, instructs us. I don't know how He does it, but He does it. He develops us, and, 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 and then we're sensitive to His Holy Spirit. So when I'm alone with God, do I feel uneasy in any way about this decision? Number three, what is the counsel? of older, deeper Christians. There's people around you that have spent more time with God than you have. And you can be prideful if you want. Will you receive this from me? You can be prideful if you want. Say, well, I know just as much as the next guy. There's no exception. There's no replacement for experience and years with God. And every time I've had a crucial decision in my life, I have sought out people. I've taken drive up to my older brother's. Jim, he's 16 years older than me. He has walked with God. That man has put himself away in a room and prayed every day of his life. I'd go up and say, Jim, you know what I'm thinking of doing. How do you feel about it? What is your counsel on that? 
if we're stubborn and stiff-necked, nobody's going to tell me, rebellious. There's a young man I've worked with over the years that has hit his head on the same pole 20 times. At what point in time will we take instruction? We can call it anything we want, but a rebellious spirit God can't use. When I'm alone with God, first of all, is there any way that this, this decision could hinder the will of God in my life? When I'm alone with God, do I feel uneasy in any way about this decision? And what is the counsel of older, deeper Christians? God will be faithful to you. He'll back up that uneasiness with someone you have confidence in, you bounce it off of them and they say, oh, I don't know, you know? Nothing wrong with that. I can understand why you want to do that. In some ways that looks like a good opportunity for you, but will that job, will that job, you always tell me that it's in the mornings when God speaks to you. Will, will that job take you out of that? Can that ultimately hinder what God would want to do in you? First of all, He wants you to know Him. Will that hinder that in any way? We need the body of believers around us seeking the counsel of older, deeper Christians. <coughs> I have written here, we have a younger generation of believers. I have seen this. We have a younger generation of believers who want to function as a body when it comes to gifts, but not when it comes to instruction. Oh, can you receive that? I think that pretty much pins it. We have a younger generation of believers who want to function as a body when it's about the gifts. Oh, you know, Pastor, we all got our gifts. Well, yeah, that's true then. But we also need to function as a body as instruct when it comes to instruction. God will put people in the body of Christ with you that can give you advice and counsel and help you stay on track. And we need to receive that and be ready to receive that. I want to have an open spirit at any time to receive. Simple message today. Don't really know the reasons for it. But I believe that God would have me say these things. Number four is, will this affect my personal time with God and my role in His body of believers? Only you can decide that. Only you can decide that. I don't want to make any decisions that will hinder the will of God in my life. A number of years ago, Christian man and I that sang together, Tom Carell, we had a quartet. Boy, did we have fun. Went to Betty Carell's funeral this week, and it was just so refreshing. My brother Jim drove down from Fort Wayne, and we sat together. And of course, Jim and I and Rod and Tom Carell all sang together for years, and cleared in our early 20s, and we spent a lot of time singing. Forever pastor, we were singing together. And we went to different states and sang, and we'd sleep in the basement of churches. We had a good, really a good time. And so it was so good to see them. Tom and I good, made good friends. I had my real estate license. The truth is, looking back on it, I was a little irritated that the ministry hadn't opened up. I wanted to be in the ministry full time. And I was a little irritated, and God wasn't doing it fast enough to suit me. I didn't see that at the time. Looking back, I see that. God wasn't working it out fast enough to suit me. So I decided to even make the statement, because God reminded me of this statement a few years later, I'm not going to work at Kroger's forever, I'm getting tired of this. I'm going to do something. Well, what that was rooted in is, is that I was just a little irritated because God hadn't worked things out at the speed I thought he should. So I got the bright idea, I was going to get my real estate license, so I started studying and went over to Kokomo and took, uh, actually, uh, Charlotte Curry's half-brother, Dave Hires, he and I were friends made friends through that. I'd known each other in high school. We did some studying together at the library. And I got my realtor's license. And only to find out that there was a whole lot of things that happened in that business that I didn't feel real good about. You couldn't sleep real well. 
after you did some of the transactions. And there was a lot of things in that business that troubled me. But having my realtor's license, we had the option of looking at houses first before anyone else could. Multiple listing service, we could, I could go into any realtor's office and get keys and we could look at places. So Tom and I got the bright idea we were going to start an apartment business. And so we began buying apartments. Well, we went way too fast and used way too much credit. And it wasn't long until we had 11, 11 apartments. Well, I won't go into it, but wasn't long after that we were losing our shirt and we had to begin trying to work back out of that. Was there anything wrong with two young Christian men wanting to be in a business partnership? partnership? No. no. Anything wrong with that? No. Did we have some camaraderie and good times? Yes. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. But I believe with all my heart, in my case, now Tom's going a different direction and that's fine. But I think in my case, the enemy was trying to get me to make decisions that would hinder what God wanted to do in my life. Because when the opportunity did come in to go into full-time ministry, I took it. But boy, did I have financial burdens for several years because of those mistakes. And I believe the enemy had studied that and saw my eagerness to do something. And active young man, energetic young man. And I don't want to make any decisions that hinder the will of God in my life. I'm almost finished. This is huge, folks, in relationships. In relationships, please hear me. Don't make decisions that will hinder what God wants to do. Oh, pastor, you don't know how lonely I am, and I want to be sensitive to that. Loneliness is a painful thing. There's three forms of mental anguish. Some things are painful. They're suffering of different kinds emotionally, but three forms of mental anguish. Loneliness, rejection, and misunderstanding. Pastor, I'm so lonely. We want to be sensitive to that. We want to be there in the body of Christ as your friend and your helper. But don't make decisions that will hinder what God wants to do in your life. How many people have gone down the wrong path and got unequally yoked and hooked up with somebody and the rest of their life they were unable to do what God's glorious plan was for their life? You know anybody like that? That's done that. They spent their life in a constant tug of war. Because the devil walked him into a decision. The answer is time with God. Don't be fearful. Don't be paranoid or the response to the message thinking, oh boy, he's got me scared half to death to decide anything. No, no, no. The four things I have. First, ask yourself the honest question and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Could this hinder the will of God? Do I feel any uneasiness? What is the counsel, and I think we've really dropped the ball on that, of older and deeper Christians? You know that usually when something's in a big hurry, it's a mistake? Uh huh. Might as well shake your head this way. Usually when something's in a big hurry, oh, this is the right thing, you need to do this right away. No. Well, that's one red flag right there. Whenever something's in a big hurry, it's usually a mistake. If God actually wants something done in a big hurry, He usually just does it without us messing with it. He'll just do it, it'll just happen. There's times something will just happen and you look back and say, well, that's over with it. Because God went ahead and did it because he operates in a different way and he wants us to be patient and think and take our time. What is the counsel of others and how will this affect my personal time with God? Relationship decisions. That's huge. How easy it is to get in a relationship that takes you in the wrong direction. I want to say one more thing about that before I close on relationship. I don't want to make any friendships. That might surprise you a little bit. Well, I don't want to make any friendships that veer me away from what God wants me to be. You hear me? I don't want to make any friends. I feel the Lord's thumb in my back on that one. I don't want to make any friendships that veer me away from what God would have me to be. There's a guy a number of years ago, and very few of you here would even know him if I say his name. There's a guy a number of years ago that I made friends with. And I felt God spoke to me. His priorities were just different. <laughs> he, he just, I felt God spoke to me and said, Tom, begin, begin separating yourself from this person. Oh, now, Pastor, if he's a Christian, you're all going to be in heaven together. You've got to get along. we got along. But hey, hello, we don't have our glorified body yet. <laughs> and sometimes there's combinations that just don't work very well. 
And, and me and this, this man, I finally said to my wife, I said, I've just got to get away from him. Every time I'm around him, it drags me down. It frustrates me. It overwhelms me. I can't deal with it. The enemy likes to walk us into decisions relationally. Oh, it's a good thing. You're going to be a witness to them. You're going to help them. God, order my relationships. I want to stay in the center of your will. I don't want to get to the left or to the right. Well, you can't accuse me today of not driving one point here. But that's been on my mind, and I felt I needed to share it. I am going to close this 20 till 12. Don't make any decisions that will hinder the will of God in your life. Let's stand together for prayer.